Hi everyone here and around the world. Thanks so much for your great support the past four weeks as this Earth Files YouTube channel has broken through 263,000 subscribers. The whole time, even now this week, I have also been fighting a persistent flu bug that has brought me fevers, ear aches, lots of coughing and losing my voice, which may happen tonight but I'm going to try. And that's why there were Earth Files rebroadcasts. But at least tonight, I have the ability to talk until I can't. <laughs> I did make the Sedona Ascension Conference in Arizona, where there were many discussions about the Pentagon's All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, also known as Arrow. Allegedly, Arrow was set up to investigate UFO UAPs, but instead it keeps pushing a debunking line that there is nothing unusual, just terrestrial, or quote, a few days ago, human made, close quote. Arrow has even attacked military sources such as David Grush, who did not deserve to be attacked. Another recent example is this reddit.com headline a few days ago around March 14th, quote, Recovered Material and Bismuth Magnesium. Experimentation on alleged extraterrestrial spacecraft sample, like the piece that Tom DeLong of To the Stars purchased from Linda Moulton Howe and turned over to the U.S. Army in 2018. Arrow has concluded that a sample from an alleged crashed off-world spacecraft that Arrow acquired from the Arrow, uh, from the uh, Tom DeLong to the stars, and that the Army became involved, that the Arrow uh, concluded about that metal, that it is a manufactured terrestrial alloy and does not represent off-world technology or possess any exceptional qualities that the metal that went to from Linda to the stars to the army is, quote, human made, close quote. The sample is primarily composed of magnesium, zinc, and bismuth, and some other trace elements such as lead. This assessment is based on its materials characterization, close quote. Well, back in April 1996, when I was doing investigative radio reports for Coast to Coast AM and Dreamland with Art Bell, we received odd metal pieces from a U.S. Army sergeant, whom I got to talk with once briefly on the phone when he called en route to the Middle East, uncertain if he would return. In addition to the metal pieces, the Army sergeant mailed his grandfather's diary pages about pulling the layered metal pieces off of the bottom of a wedge-shaped craft, close quote, in New Mexico in the late 1940s without giving a specific date or specific site. Here is the first letter postmarked South Carolina and signed a friend dated April 10th, 1996 and included several square cut gray metal pieces. Quote, Dear Mr. Bell, I followed your broadcast over the last year or so and have been considering whether or not to share with you and your listeners some information related to the Roswell UFO crash. 
My grandfather was a member of the retrieval team sent to the crash site just after the incident was reported. He died in 1974, but not before he had sat down with some of us and talked about the incident. I am currently serving in the military and hold a security clearance and do not wish to go public and risk losing my career and commission. Nonetheless, I would like to briefly tell you what my own grandfather told me about Roswell. In fact, I enclose for your safekeeping samples that were in the possession of my grandfather until he died, and which I have had since his own estate was settled. As I understand it, they came from the UFO debris and were among a large batch subsequently sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio from New Mexico. My grandfather was able to, quote, appropriate them, close quote, and stated that the metallic samples are, quote, pure extract aluminum, close quote. You will note that they appear old and tempered, and they have been placed in tissue paper and in baggies for posterity. Further quote, I have had them since 1974, and after considerable thought and reflection, give them to you. Feel free to share them with any of your friends in the UFO research community. As my granddad stated, the team arrived at the crash site just after the Army Air Force, U.S. Air Force, reported the ground zero location. They found two dead occupants hurled free of the disk, and a lone surviving occupant was found within the disk, and it was apparent its left leg was broken. There was a minimal radiation contamination and it was quickly dispersed with a water solvent wash and soon the occupant was dispatched for medical assistance and isolation. The bodies were sent to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for dispersal. The debris was also loaded onto three trucks which finished the onload just before the sunset. Granddad was part of the team that went with the surviving occupant who communicated via telepathic means. The disk was a probe ship dispatched from a launch ship that was stationed at the dimensional gateway to the Terran Earth solar system. The occupants were part of a race of explorers from a solar system 32 light years from Terra Earth. They had been conducting operations on Terra for over 100 years. The dimensional power plant was self-destructed and the inner atmospheric propulsion system also deactivated to prevent the technology from falling into the hands of the Earth humans. Grandad spent a total of 26 weeks in the team that examined and debriefed the one survivor of the Roswell crash. Grandad's affiliation with the project ended when the occupant was to be transported to a long-term facility. He was placed on board a U.S. Air Force transport aircraft that was to be sent to Washington, D.C. But the aircraft and all aboard disappeared under mysterious and disturbing circumstances en route to Washington, D.C. It may interest you that three fighter aircraft dispatched to investigate a distress call from the transport experienced many electrical malfunctioning systems failures as they entered the airspace of the transport's last reported location. No crash or debris of the transport was ever found. The team was disbanded. Well, I realize I have likely shocked you with this bizarre and incredible account, and seeking to remain unknown likely doesn't do anything for my credibility and the metal samples only will likely add to the controversy. I am passing through South Carolina with an operational readiness mobility exercise and will mail this just prior to the exercise, possibly from the Charleston area. I will listen to your broadcast to receive any acknowledging or confirmation that you have received this package. This letter and the contents of this package are given to you with the hope that it helps contribute to discussion on the subject of UFO phenomena. I agree with Neil Armstrong 
a good friend of mine, who dared to say at the White House, no less, that there are things out there which boggle the mind and are far beyond our ability to comprehend. Sign me a friend, close quote. After my first research efforts, I photographed this alleged micron-layered extraterrestrial metal that the grandfather, according to the Army guy, he, the grandfather pulled some of the pieces off the bottom of the wedge-shaped craft in the late 1940s. I worked with a University of Michigan scientist who requested anonymity but provided weeks of research images and analysis. Further, a Carnegie Institute scientist used an ion microprobe to analyze the micron-layered silver and black metal made of 26 alternating layers of 1 to 4 microns black bismuth and 100 to 200 microns of silver magnesium zinc alloy that was 96.4% magnesium with 11% more magnesium 26 in it than normal earth magnesium. Each of six pieces <clears throat> received from U.S. Army source were formed with a curvature that tapered. Over the past 28 years, since April of 1996, I have contacted several different scientists and laboratories for tests and analysis of what the metal is made of and what its function might have been on a wedge-shaped craft of unknown origin that allegedly crashed between San Mateo Mountains below Socorro and west of Roswell at Sierra Blanca on or near White Sands Proving Ground about 90 miles west of Roswell, New Mexico. The, the specific crash retrieval date is uncertain, but must have been after September 18, 1947, when the U.S. Air Force was separated from the U.S. Army. The Army source references the U.S. Air Force, which didn't exist before September 18, 1947. One military source told me the date was actually in 1949, not 1947, but that as a crash date for this is not confirmed. These various shaped silver pieces were in the first April 10th, 1996 shipment from the U.S. Army source. I contacted Alcoa Aluminum to see if they would test some of the pieces. They agreed, and an Alcoa manager called me and asked, where did you get these? They are 99% pure aluminum, and we don't process at that purity level, close quote. In a second letter from the Army Sergeant, postmarked April 22, 1996, from South Carolina, he wrote, quote, what is today fiber optic technology was part and parcel of the alien technology within the control panels that became fused and melted when the self-destruct mechanism was activated. There were Westinghouse affiliated persons on the team and Grandad always thought that some of them had gone back with the knowledge and incorporated it into the future research with the phone systems. Of course, the military was concerned as to the ability of the aliens to enter our atmosphere at will, undetected, and thus they recommended to the president that a space program be set into motion and that a system of satellites be placed into orbit by 1957 and this satellite system be patched into the then due line early warning system which became later NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command. Grandad stated that it was his opinion that NORAD was formed not only to track possible ICBMs from hostile nations, but as an established detection system for UFO craft. That is why the NASA Space Agency has been incorporated by and large with our armed forces, and there are so many classified missions. This is my opinion, but Grandad prophesied such occurring as far back as 1971, implying the militarization of space. 
Well, I am scheduled to travel back to Charleston Air Force Base and then Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina with JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command. I'll mail this from somewhere in South Carolina. I probably won't communicate again. My wife is concerned, as am I, that the intelligence agencies will put two and two together. So it is inadvisable to further communicate this information. I hope you understand my position. I could likely face a court's martial or sedition charges for stating some of this information and opinions. Further information regarding the Roswell crash and my own grandfather's affiliation would likely be potentially beneficial in your efforts at correlation and verification. In this regard, I can only say, based on past conversations on the subject with Grandad, that the retrieval team consisted of three segments, the on-site team, the in-house team, and the security team. The credentials of the team members weren't only military related. There were individuals with backgrounds from the University of Colorado, the Office of Naval Research, the Army Air Force, the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Army, the University of California, Los Angeles, and the Atomic Energy Commission and National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics and Office of Scientific Research and Development. Additionally, there were consultants from England, France, and Russia involved. There were control-type devices forged in the shape of the alien hand, which were assumed as controls and activation surfaces, close quote. This U.S. Army man also holds, quote, UFO panels with depressions of six-fingered handprints allegedly found with two six-fingered humanoids in May 31st to June 2nd, 1947, at a UFO recovery operation at a crash site southwest of Socorro, New Mexico, close quote. The black and white photograph is from 16 millimeter film leaked in 1995 to Ray Santilli, owner, Orbital Media Limited in London, England. At the end of the Army Sergeant's second letter, postmarked South Carolina, April 22nd, 1996, quote, you would be surprised at the extent of internal policies on this subject and the consequences for current commissioned officers talking about UFO phenomena. I was surprised by Edgar Mitchell's statements of recent date, and I imagine there are many involved with Roswell who are a bit upset at events underway. However, Dr. Mitchell is a man of outstanding character and integrity and knows whereof he speaks, as do quite a few other astronauts. And he closed with, quote, I wish you, Art and Linda, all the best and will be listening. I commend your courage and integrity. I hope your listeners understand that the subject of Roswell has great potential at extrapolating the truth on UFOs and what has come to be known as a cosmic Watergate is only the tip of an iceberg. Granddad said that when the truth does come out, humanity will be changed beyond comprehension. He also said many on the in-house team lobbied to release the information to the public. Not all of them were paranoid in trusting the public with the truth. Sign me, still a friend, close quote. And yesterday, March 19th, 2024, the first day of spring, came honest words from a retired physicist who knows a lot about the New Mexico late 1940s UFO metal skin made of very thin, one to four micron sized, pure black bismuth layers, alternating with larger 100 to 200 micron thick magnesium zinc layers, plus other nearly pure aluminum metals. Tonight, I am sharing the physicist's own recently written comments to me about the Pentagon Aero Office's dishonest, quote, 
human-made claim about the bismuth, magnesium, zinc layered metals and the nearly pure aluminum metals that I've investigated since April 1996, 28 years ago. And here is the first page of two pages sent to me from the physicist. Quote, Linda, in order to prepare for a complete and accurate response, I would need to review the results of all testing of the materials recently by the various labs that confirmed the exact nature of the original materials that have been tested. These test results should provide the evidence required to counter the human-made claims of Pentagon Arrow Sean Kirkpatrick. That is a direct quote from the physicist's letter. Continuing quote, not only is the material purity and structure inconsistent with similar materials found on Earth, but the manner in which the layers were created were well beyond the capabilities of human produced layer deposition in the time frame in which those materials were stated to have been collected and stored. Decades ago, I had personally examined similar materials that were stored in secure vaults. The materials that I had examined and performed testing upon at that time were in both damaged and undamaged condition. So I had gathered a lot of experience working with these materials during my career. They can be very dangerous to test to those unfamiliar with how they can respond to applied energy. They can also be damaged by an incorrect application of energy that is foreign to their operation. This is how those materials ended up in our hands, so to speak. As I had mentioned prior, in 2014 to 2017, I believe when I had examined those material samples long before, apparent atmospheric friction heating had caused a lot of damage to the outer facing surface layers of those samples. The damage lessened as the layers progressed inward. That damage would have greatly impacted the operating efficiency of the materials. The physics involved is highly advanced, now commonly referred to as quantum physics. In my era, we had to fabricate, to fabricate a null G, which is null gravity room, in order to even begin a fabrication process. The presence of gravity caused distortions in crystalline formations. As we progressed in stages, we had to rebuild the null G room multiple times with newer generation materials in order to finally reach a high enough state of crystalline perfection in the end product. Without this, the materials produced would be greatly flawed, as we discovered had occurred prior to my involvement in the program. This was done to prevent eventual fatal neural tissue damage to occupants exposed to flawed null G fields. With the newer generation materials, we were also able to greatly increase drive efficiency, which greatly reduced operational energy costs and greatly increased performance." Close quote. Next week, I would like to share with you some of the original ion microprobes, the original work that I did with the uh, scanning, the original work that I did in a major university. There's a lot. And all of it goes against the Aero Office's dismissal that all of this was human made. Absurd. And now, in having this first presentation sort of laying out what the source of the materials originally came with, with these uh, valuable letters from the U.S. Army sergeant, who was the uh, son of the grandfather, grandson of the grandfather, um, I also look forward to being able to show in great detail the science work that we did and why 
it was very interesting to other people in 2018 who wanted to now apply more testing and application of the layered bismuth and magnesium materials in technology. And as we speak right now, on March 20th of 2024, it is my understanding that still the application of the bismuth magnesium zinc layered material that involves the placement atom by atom of iridium in the pure aluminum, one of the keys, we still cannot do. We still cannot do. So I look forward to sharing more. But right now, Ian, I'm wondering if we have some questions and comments. Yes, thank you very much, Linda. And it's great to be back with a live with you as well. And thank all the audience are here and uh, wishing you well as well and uh, continued recovery. I thank hope you. so. And that my voice will not give out again. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead, Ian. Okay, straight away from Sonia's Into Another World News, uh, she says, why did To The Stars even turn it over to the army in the first place? Well, there are only so many laboratories, seriously, that have the ability to work on any of some of these more exotic materials. I have found that myself. If you jump back to 1996 and I am going on coast to coast and dreamland with art, in the first a week or two, and we began getting uh, like, well, you need to do X and you need to go Y. And there are very few labs that could tell you anything about this. I mean, at, at the beginning, and then I started working in, I worked, I was there in the ion microprobe at Carnegie Institute when we were especially examining the magnesium and the bismuth. But, the, but everything, it was, I was there for seven or eight hours uh, while Eric Howery, the ion microprobe specialist who sadly passed in, uh, recently. Uh, it, so it is it, it, the, the ability to investigate. There are so many directions in physics and medicine and on and on where you there are only <clears throat> a few people who might have the ability or even the instruments to do some of the investigations on materials that have allegedly been retrieved from UFOs. I have been involved in other uh, cases, sort of similar parallel track, where you have something that the modern lab can't go in the direction like, for example, the, the most outstanding right now about the bismuth magnesium zinc is that the iridium atoms in the aluminum are very important, but they have to be placed atomically in straight lines or 90 degree angles to each other. And that that is what the goal is. But being able to even work at that level is something, as I understand it, that we don't have labs that can do that. So there are, there are stop places in research where it almost becomes evidentiary that we are trying to investigate something that humans have never encountered before, the opposite of the arrow dismissal human made. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, Taro Tarotina says these metals are done in a kind of cold vacuumed process, which is still not possible yet on Earth. And she references Colonel Wendell Stevens with that quote. Well, let's take in the comments that you all have. I know that I am trying to the best of my ability. And next week I will be showing you some more fascinating actual hard science. It, and that is where every one of us should be trying to uh, walk, is evidentiary material. And uh, I'm curious if you have any other uh, comments of people tonight, Ian, who may actually have 
some information that maybe they haven't shared until now that we're talking about this more. Yeah, I'm looking at as well. If anyone has any um, more experiences, they could uh, let me know. Now, the other question which we need to keep clear up here from Amy Pasternak says, Linda, why did you decide to sell the metal and did you keep any? Because it was getting to that point where the technology that was needed was not someplace. I couldn't go into the Army base or a Navy or whatever. Um, and I had been holding and being, cons I'll, I'll be very honest, 1996 to 2018, even though I'm an American, an American citizen, I had concern several times about whether where I live would be broken into to get those materials. And there are reasons why, but I won't go into now. And it got to a point where at least the scientists, I met Steve Justice, and I, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, I knew how put off, uh, and th those were the ones that were now circulating around the To the Stars effort by Tom DeLong. And since I had already talked with him many times, how put off and I, Jacques Vallée and I had talked about all kinds of facets of information and what would be necessary to do next tests. And there was nothing that was easy. And right now, I think that the atomic placement of the iridium in the pure aluminum is of great interest. But as far as I know to date, tonight, it isn't something that we can do. We would need to have extraterrestrial help. Maybe there are units that are working with tall whites, Nordics. Uh, this is it all, all comes to us anecdotally from, in my case, from people who have contacted me and said that they have worked with a tall white in some kind of lab or engineering room and they have information, but they're not in the process of controlling or duplicating. So this is, this is complicated when you get something that has been made by extraterrestrials for, and we humans, unless we work with them, we aren't yet able to understand how to duplicate it. And maybe that's the stop-go control that the ETs have had over us for a long time we get up to a point where we are beginning to understand X and then Y comes in and it is astounding and we want to do Z tests and we can't do Z tests unless we have the help of the non-human intelligences that created whatever we're interested in. I think that part of the landscape has been like that. And then I also am curious, curious it, coming back to why I uh, decided I'm not going to be involved in the testing that To The Stars was going to work in the Army base. I'm not going to be a part of that investigation team. And they need the material. And it may be a, a very valuable breakthrough. And so it just seemed logical with all the conditions and factors coming into focus the 2018 made sense. Instead of worrying about it, instead of worrying about somebody breaking in to find the material, because there's only a limited, a very limited amount. Uh, Art and I got to see the first six samples, and then it was parsed out to people, myself included, to uh, do research, and it would get cut. They would get cut up, these original pieces. So it's like anything in life, you have to analyze what is the upside of doing X and what is the downside. And since I wasn't going to be involved with the United States Army or any of the scientists that they were involving, even though I, I love science the most, I love investigating the science, that, <clears throat> that just seemed natural uh, a normal since they wanted to have a piece 
and we're looking for other pieces and this would be sort of like the dovetail end of a cycle of me being the one who physically went to these various places like I did at Carnegie and worked with others trying to find out what it was. <coughs> Hopefully my, my poor influenza ridden voice will make it a little bit further. Uh, <coughs> go ahead, Ian. Yeah, I've got uh, John Colfarrell sick here in the chat says, he references Bob Lazar. He says, this brings to mind what Bob Lazar stated about the craft he was trying to back engineer, that all the surfaces were made, were as if made of wax. Were made? It's as if all surfaces were as if made of wax. That's what he says. Were made of <laughs> wax? Yeah, I don't know exactly I, what he's saying. No, I, I don't recognize, but I can tell you and share it tonight that back in the, was the summer of 1990, because I was working at CNN on Earthbeat in 1989. And this would have been uh, December, after December, of 89. It would have been uh, that summer of 1990, I'm, I think, pretty confidently. And uh, I knew Bob uh, and Lear and uh, all of these guys from having worked on my books and have some of their uh, input and had talked with Bob Lazar many times about various aspects of work that he was exposed to. Uh, he was criticized for not getting a degree or saying that he had a degree from Harvard or MIT. And he told me privately, he said, it's really hurtful. He said, I was born without parents. He said, I'm adopted. And I don't know who my parents and my family are and my adoptee family do not make very much money. And in high school, my best friends and I did things with electronics and exploring magnetic and, and all of the things that people, when they get into teens, if they're at all bent towards science, they will work on projects together. And Bob told me that he had two really good friends and each of them, I think, one got into MIT, one got maybe into Harvard, but whatever the specific universities, high-end good universities, and that he couldn't, his parents, the adoptive parents couldn't afford to send him there. And he said he was invited by his friends to go up to sit in to classes at MIT and the other and that he did this for a week or two like a vacation and that he really liked it and that he ended up somehow, this is how he allegedly got into uh, uh, work having to do with other institutions, which I won't go into because I do not know what the truth is, but other places, uh, and that he ended up getting a not very long, but a short and very interesting assignment. I believe it was through the Navy that check stubs were from the Navy that he was paid and that he was assigned to do an examination of that element 119 and that as far as Bob was concerned, this was a UFO. It had some very different system. It involved element 119, or if, if I'm mischaracterizing that title, I'm, I'm just trying to remember some of the details, A another element on the periodic table, and that he worked uh, on this for, I think it was t uh, t only like a few weeks, might have been a couple of months uh, officially, and, and that he was exposed to the information that he has talked to about 
privately and occasionally publicly. And I completely believe Bob Lazar. Right? He had no reason to lie. Uh, and so these various reporters of information from being exposed to, in this case, uh, we'll say a, a short-term assignment that Bob Lazar had. And today, I don't know, I totally respect everything that I've heard and that he did and he and I've talked about uh, in some detail going way back. So everyone runs into the same problem. Myself, Bob Lazar, the scientists who want to work on the bismuth magnesium zinc, it's the same thing. You get blocked at a certain point you're just blocked. Whoever is in control at the bigger levels, JSOC, offices in the Pentagon, it, it, you just get blocked at certain levels. And I think everybody in the Earth Files YouTube world, with me for sure, we feel strongly that telling the whole truth finally to the Earth and letting the chips fall where they may in order to get humanity in a reality check on what is really happening on our Earth, our Moon, the solar system, our galaxy, and far beyond. This is not confined to this solar system. This is a universe that is filled with consciousness, as physicists like Roger Penrose have said. Okay, Ian. Uh, I just want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge our generous audience in the Super Chats this evening. And let me just tell you, Linda, that we've got people all, all over the United States and Canada and uh, a lot of Europe, including the Netherlands tonight. We've also got people in from Ecuador, Nicaragua and Argentina here tonight. Oh, I'm so glad. I love the fact that we have so many countries tuning in and we all want the truth. We want facts. And that's what I hope we're moving toward now, sooner than later. And it's wonderful to have you all coming. Thank you. Go ahead. Ian. Okay, so, so here we go. Uh, thank you to Moonbird, Jerry Tobias, High Tech Computers, Caroline Boyce, Yin Yang Glow, Cindy Vol, Northern Lights, Camp Freedom, and I also want to say hi and welcome aboard to Amanda Brinkley, who says, you have literally been in my life via the TV for decades. It's so <laughs> nice to just be able to say hi to you. I've appreciated your work for years and thank you for all you've done. Oh, thank you, all of you. Um, it is wanting to agape hug all of my fellow humans in what is to me is beginning to feel sort of exciting, even though the earth also feels very dangerous now. But it is that we maybe are finally close to this huge truth. And it just seems to me that in every square inch of this entire universe, that there is something that is pulling for the truth. And it sure is happening here. Go ahead, Ian. Yeah, and uh, Judy just reminds me as well, Australia's watching, and we know, yes, Rosanna Rigby there as well from Australia, I believe. And um, let me add right here, Ian, one yes. of the few places that I've had probably the most number of reports from firsthand interaction with tall whites is Australia. I don't know why okay. that is, but that is, and anybody watching in Australia, if you personally, or you know anyone personally who is in some kind of a teaching or an association or some kind of a discussion or relationship learning from a tall white, I would love to hear from you. Earthfiles at okay. earthfiles.com. Go ahead, Ian. Tracy Murray is in the chat this evening and she says, Linda, do you still believe disclosure will come ever? Obviously, this... Uh, report from the from arrow and uh, i think someone's referencing it as a narrow arrow report uh may have dented people's confidence in a disclosure coming 
Did you see one of the headlines after this obnoxious arrow statement that used the word incompetent report? Incompetent. That's what they were saying about the arrow statements, which I completely agree with. But it is calculated incompetence. It is trained incompetence. We are now seeing in front of us what Philip J. Corso saw during the Eisenhower administration, also in the Pentagon, that we are, it, it isn't truth that is being used to deflect public interest. It is make something seem less than it is, uh, convince people that there's nothing there nothing there, nothing unusual, human made, go away, nothing to see. It's a strategy. It's a tactic. It has been used by the military and the Pentagon and other uh, administrations. Isn't the whole, if you puncture it all, and you say, what is the very essence of what seems to be important and is com being completely denied. And the importance is we are a life species in this universe. I personally think we are the product of genetic manipulation in already evolving primates and that there have been all kinds of humanoids and we are a form for any of the product of genetic manipulation to end up and evolving as humanity has, always in the context of no one telling us the truth about the universe teeming with consciousness and that we are ourselves the product of some calculated manipulation. It seems to me that fundamentally Humanity, human consciousness, deserves to always to know the truth because there is something about the testing of our evolution that relates to the yin and yang symbol. I'm convinced that is true. And part of this huge, gigantic test that we are in and being watched and monitored by some, being manipulated and punished by others, being hurt, being neutralized by even a third, when you know the truth about something that has as many moving parts and facets as the whole issue of other intelligences in this universe mixing and matching genes on a whole bunch of planets and manipulating growth, manipulating evolution, and now we look in a mirror, homo sapien. We look in a mirror and we are not alone. We never have been alone. And we are owed, from my point of view, to see the man, the woman, the being in that mirror who has made us. And it doesn't frighten me. It doesn't scare me. Because there's 8 billion of us on the earth now, and we are now threatening our own future by not being able to control the emissions and what is causing our planet to warm up. A lot of it does have to do with methane and CO2. No matter what you read of people's denying, those are two huge ingredients. And in fact, I remember suddenly vividly just came in. Back in, uh, my daughter was born in 1974 and we were uh, in Boston and I was doing the medical uh, programming at WCVB, the ABC station. And uh, there was a, I'm trying to remember, uh, Ian, I, I, this is something that I probably don't remember well enough. Go ahead and go to another question. Yeah, okay, we can always come back to that. I've just got some very quick questions we need to clear up about the actual material itself. Yeah. Uh, here's one from Jason W.C. Hickey. Question, does the layering support cloaking tech? Does 
What's the next word? Does the, does the layering, the layering of the material support cloaking technology? And I think as well, maybe we can say, I think uh, it was Richard Dolan may have referenced this as well about it uh, being anti-gravidic properties. Um, maybe I'm anticipating uh, the results of further tests that you're going to be revealing next week. But also, Andrew Rollins says, was the UFO material radioactive? Okay, back to bismuth. Uh, I have articles and notes going all the way back uh, to uh, when I was trying to investigate for Coast well, and Art that the presence of the bismuth did raise the issue of neutralizing gravity. And so we are, we are lacking the language that is necessary to understand and be able to talk about all of these various complex facets. But I know that that was raised several times in different discussions with different people when I began the research that the bismuth might have something to do with neutralizing gravity. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Rosanna Rigby says, uh, Linda, out of all of your episodes and stories, which one is your favorite and why? Of all the things that have happened, I think, I think that what pops in and, and I resonate has to be when I was uh, 20, 21, 20, I think, in the Idaho, uh, in the back country at that airport, uh, running all of the laps and climbing that mountain up and down for two weeks because I wanted to be strong and everything as good as I could make it for the Miss America pageant that September of 1963. And that when suddenly there was that light at the top of that hill where I was climbing quite high and the beam and my moving into slow motion and then finding myself at the bottom of the mountain with no, no memory. It's like so many people and I know it sounds like an abduction. You're at one point, then you're in another point then you're in another point and you have no memory of anything in between. That's what that was like. And then it was the warm jello feeling of my own hands being lifted up in front of me and this thought voice, which would be telepathy, the thought voice, you are one with the light, the light is one with you and you're in the hands of God forever. And it has the echoes of that have lasted to this day. They, and that is the most powerful. That's what I think about. That's something that takes you at a point in your life and you are never the same again. And you begin to look at everything through that lens. What is evil? What is no evil? And that it seems to be the forces in many ways that keep being played out in Earth and perhaps in this universe. And that the sense of the power of that penetrating light, you are one with the light, that nothing, nothing can do anything to that light. That's why I think it is the most powerful experience of my life. Go ahead. Yeah, referencing the um, culture, pure says pure metals elements can be synthesized rather than mined, especially the heavy elements. Aliens may not mine for elements, which is why they are so pure. Well, one thing in our uh, wonderful Earth Files audience in all of the countries and the United States and everywhere, I extend my hand to the scientists, to the doctors, to the professionals who may have first-hand information 
about the bismuth, magnesium, zinc, layered metals, and that you could, as other people do, you can send me through hard mail or FedEx or proton mail information that would be helpful for me to share at Earth Files and the Earth Files YouTube channel. And some people I have successfully been able to have dialogue for years in the, a safe way. But I guess tonight that the words that are filling my head is why should there be so many people so scared that the government is going to kill them or rob them or do something because we are talking about technology, money, and power, and that those three want to sustain what they have and they want to monopolize the evolution. When the big story, the big impact that could be positive for the whole planet that is in this dangerous time would be sharing about everything, letting everybody know the whole truth. That impact on the human all over the surface of the earth, it might be the one thing that would help us change and evolve from the fires, the descent into hell that seem to be happening in various parts of our planet. The future through that lens seems scary, maybe self-destructive. The lens being told the truth about our own evolution, the relationship with other extraterrestrials that have a vested interest of some sort in what they have been doing in this solar system and many others, it might be a positive evolution revolution for humanity, planet Earth, and all of the living creatures, billions it seems, that are having so much trouble and struggle to stay alive. Every day there are headlines somewhere in the New York Times or else about all of the different populations of animals on Earth that are dying at rates that scare scientists. If we could turn this around, if we could get past needing methane and carbon, if we could have an honest world and a dialogue with how do we have a planet that has all the resources it needs that reinforces life, that helps life sustain itself, it all seems worth trying to me to keep doing the work I'm doing, just hoping that that is the revolution, not wars, not tactical nuke strikes, not any of that, really changing to where life, life is the goal everywhere perhaps with souls that know how to evolve in certain rich matter and that there are advanced intelligences who know what that balance, what that equation is. And we humans are pushing at the very edges of destruction of it. I really love you guys. I love being here to, to talk with you about all of this on Wednesday nights. And hopefully I will be able to keep this going and that next week I will return with more fascinating information about the science behind the bismuth, magnesium, zinc, and the nearly pure aluminum that has iridium atoms in it placed atomically. And that all of you who, where I started, who may have firsthand professional knowledge, try to reach out to me in what way is fine with you 
so that I can keep reporting more and more deeply on all of the complex facets that I sense that the revolution will come no matter what. Truth eventually will win out, as the old say sayings goes. But this is now March 2024, and there are so many problems all over this planet. Help me learn more truth so I can keep reporting it, and hopefully it will make a difference. Thank you. See you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select a language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been <laughs>